All right, so we are the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society. Um, my name is Sarah White. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Society. Um, so I am in visitor services and I also do um, adult programming. And of course, there is a fire truck going down the street. Oh, right as we start, right? Um, the mission of the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society is to share the stories of Northampton County's past to encourage personal reflection, community dialogue, and an understanding of history's impact on our lives. It is our vision that through exploring local history, we will foster a more caring, respectful, and inclusive community. The Sigel Museum, where NCHGS is based, is home to a significant collection of pre-European settlement artifacts, curated, loaned, and donated in collaboration with the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. Our newest permanent exhibit, Destination Northampton County, tells the stories of those who settled here long ago as well as today. We encourage you to become a member of NCHGS for invitations to opening receptions, free museum admission, and free access to our research library. For more information on our exhibits and our programs, please visit www.sigilmuseum.org. We will have a question and answer period following the conversation. Um, so if you do have any questions for um, our two participants, you can please feel free to drop, drop them into the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. We will respond to as many as time allows. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is provide a brief background into the history of garment making in Northampton County um, to provide a little bit of contact, context for Marianne and Ellen's work, and then we'll begin the conversation. Um, so garment production was one of the biggest industries in the late 19th and early 20th century in Northampton County. Um, we are located equidistant from New York City and Philadelphia. Um, so by the turn of the 20th century, there were 23 established silk mills in the Lehigh Valley, making Pennsylvania the second largest producer of silk in the world. The combination of the area's natural resources, including coal and waterways such as man-made canals, contributed significantly to the rapid growth of the industry, um, not just in Northampton County, but all up and down the mid-Atlantic coast and even into New England. Silk companies relied very heavily on um, immigrant women and children's labor. They worked long hours and were paid very low wages, working in unsafe and unsanitary conditions. Um, and like all industrial workers, they labored under the complete control of their employers. On March 15th, 1911, a fire broke out on the eighth floor of the Ash Building in Greenwich Village, New York. Uh, not located in the Lehigh Valley, of course, um, but here we're gonna start talking about the book that is released today uh, from our two participants. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the top three floors of this building housed the Triangle Waste Company, um, a, a factory where approximately 500 workers mostly young immigrant women and girls, labored to produce fashionable cotton blouses. Um, they were called wastes, hence where the name originates. The fire in the building killed 146 workers in a mere 15 minutes, but the consequences and the outcomes remain to this day. A powerful collection of diverse forces, um, this this work that we are discussing tonight uh, from Mary Ann and Ellen is called Talking to the Girls. Um, this work brings together stories from writers, artists, activists, scholars, and family members of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory workers. 19 contributors from across the globe speak of a singular event with a remarkable impact. Almost 111 years to the day, which is this Friday, actually. Um, so almost 111 years to the day after this tragic incident, Talking to the Girls articulates a story of a contemporary global relevance and stands as an act of collective testimony, a written memorial to the Triangle victims. Um, so I'm going to ask our participants a couple of questions tonight. Um, we will see where this conversation leads organically. And as I said, if you have any questions for our presenters, please include them in the chat feature down below. We will respond to it as many as we are able to. Okay. No, I'm listening. Sorry. Sorry. 
Great. So I wondered if we could begin with um, Marianne and Ellen telling us a little bit about yourselves and how you became interested in the history and the resonance of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. I guess go, I'll ahead. Go. go ahead, Marianne. I'll go first. Um, so thank you very much um, to everyone for coming tonight. And thank you to the Siegel Museum for hosting us. Um, it's an honor to be here in Pennsylvania, uh, the week of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. My entry into the subject actually um, starts with my identity as the child of, uh, and the grandchild of garment workers from Pennsylvania. Uh, both my mom and my grandmother worked in uh, clothing factories uh, in Luzerne County, um, Northeastern Pennsylvania, just in Pittston, actually, Pennsylvania. And so when I was a child, I heard stories about uh, my mother's experiences as a garment worker. She actually had to leave high school. Uh, her dad was a coal miner and, and uh, became ill and couldn't work anymore. So she and her mom worked in garment factories to uh, contribute to the family income. And one of the things I heard from my mother as a child uh, was uh, we knew we were safe in our factory because of what had happened to those poor girls at Triangle. So even though they're geographically uh, in different places, the Triangle story was ab absolutely relevant uh, to my mom and all the other uh, young women who worked with her. And so, and my mother was a member of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. So I grew up with stories uh, thinking very positively about the union um, and my mother's experiences as a garment worker. I learned about the fire in school also. Um, and when I was a graduate student, I had an internship at the AFL CI, uh, the George Meany Memorial Archives of the AFL CIA in Silver Spring, Maryland. And there was an exhibit on the fire and a poem by Morris Rosen Rosenfeld that was written days after and published in the Jewish Daily Forward that really moved me. And then 20 years later, um, I moved to New York, uh, back to New York, because um, I was actually born in New York, although my parents are from PA, and met a bunch of Italian American women um, and we planned a commemoration of the fire for the 90th anniversary. And that was the first time I had participated in any kind of public commemoration in front of the building. And then about seven, eight years after that, learned about an organization called Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. And I joined that organization. Um, and that really uh, has profoundly changed my life. Um, I, um, became very active in that organization. And, and we can talk about some of that later on. Um, so I guess I would say then it was my personal background, my mm -hmm. educational experiences, and then my activist inclinations uh, that get me involved in this triangle work. Okay, um, I'll take a turn. Am I turned on? Mm -hmm. okay. You're okay. Okay, great. Um, I just would follow up Marianne's comments by saying my entry into a knowledge of the Triangle Factory fire came much later. Um, I was, uh, I grew up in New Jersey. I never ever remember learning about the fire in high school. Um, so I had no knowledge of it. And I went to college and then subsequently graduate school and my field is actually American art history. But I had always been very interested in the topic of women and their working lives. And um, my dissertation and then my first book was on images of working and shopping women in New York City's 14th Street and Union Square District during the 20s and 30s. And I knew when I completed that project, by then I had trained in the social history of American art and also feminist art history. And I knew when I finished that project, I really wanted to keep working in New York City spaces and with working women. And by then um, I had fully learned about the uh, the Triangle Fire in the course of all of my study of women and labor issues. And so I basically made a move, as I like to say, I moved six blocks downtown um, and began to do research on the images. And what interested me particularly as an art historian was relationships between all different kinds of images that, in other words, between images that were not necessarily considered art and works of art and the different ways 
they worked to engage their viewers and in the case of things like editorial cartoons, make very pronounced statements on a particular topic. Mm -hmm. And so I, my first work was on the photojournalism and the editorial cartoons. I found a mural in the high school, the what's now the fashion industries high school. So I sort of worked with case studies of different types of images. I've also um, worked on memorial type of images. So again, my entry into the Triangle Fire uh, was very, very different from Mary Ann's. It's great to have those two perspectives as well. Um, so many of the, the victims of the Triangle Fire uh, were Italian and immigrant Jewish women, um, mm -hmm. especially since that's the area that they lived in. Um, can you can you tell us what daily life would have been like for them? Um, what their working conditions were like, uh, maybe perhaps the kind of food they would have eaten, what their neighborhood would have felt like? Why don't we keep rotating? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The neighbor, I mean, they lived uh, as far away from the factory as Hoboken, New Jersey. I don't know how familiar oh, wow. people are with New York, but there were workers in Hoboken, New Jersey in uh, what is now Spanish Harlem, but would have been East Harlem mm -hmm. at the time and was very mm -hmm. much an Italian immigrant community and down on the Lower East Side, but also in Greenwich Village. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they would have been, you know, kind of close, some of them, very close, some of them, but also others, uh, how they, you know, they would have taken the train down. Um, and uh, some of them surely would have walked to work. Uh, they, um, for Italians, that's, I mean, that's my ethnic background. Uh, so I'm a little bit more familiar uh, with, with that history. Um, but for the Italians, they would have brought over a tradition of sewing from Italy. So girls in Italy would have been taught how to sew um, as preparation for running a household someday. So they would make their trousseau and they would you know, make these beautiful, um, tablecloths and things like that. So they were very adept at sewing. And that was part of what both attracted them to the industry, but also got them recruited for the industry. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, I don't know if people are familiar with the concept of chain migration. And what that refers to basically is, um, you know, a group of, of um, migrants from a particular region will go, you know, come to the US, for example, and, and settle there and then encourage others from their home regions to come and live near them in proximity uh, for obvious reasons, right? Their strength in numbers, your familiar customs. And that happened also in industries. So once, you know, it, Italians and Jewish uh, workers got a toehold in the garment industry, they would recruit others mm. uh, of their ethnic group to come and work. Um, it was considered an appropriate place for Italian immigrant women to work uh, because they there were other Italian immigrant men and women there with them. Um, the needle trades were predom predominantly, um, there were many, many immigrant women who worked in the trades. Uh, the hours were long. Um, you know, the eight hour day was not, not a, a, a feature of industrial uh, work in the early 20th century that was fought for tooth and nail. The pay was uh, low, although Triangle wasn't a sweatshop. Um, it was a factory and it was a modern factory, um, but, but that, you know, within the, those parameters, it still was not, I mean, it would have been loud. It would have been really crowded. Mm -hmm. um, there would have been, um, um, the air would have been filled with particles of fabric because they, they worked very hard to cram as many machines and workers into the, the loft in New York. The interesting thing about factories in New York, garment factories like Triangle, um, if you walked past the building today, it's an NYU building, it's a science building, and it's 10 floors. And it looks like it's a neo-Renaissance building and it looks like this really lovely 10 floor building. It doesn't look like a factory. We expect a horizontal building mm -hmm. for a factory. These were loft buildings. They were intended primarily for storage. It was a state of the art building, um, but it was still not well ventilated. There were minimal safety codes. Um, and the, um, the owners of the factory petitioned to have the, the vertical height count towards the square footage so that they could, um, they could act as if there, it was a bigger factory than it actually was and put more people in there. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to remember too, is that particularly in the case of Italians, uh, it, because this is the group I know better, mm -hmm. most of them um, 
In fact, I believe all of the triangle workers from Italy, about a third of the 146 who died uh, were Italians, for example. They came from the south and they would have come from very rural communities. Mm. So they weren't used to factory work. So you can imagine your first day on the job. And some of them were 14 years old, the oldest ones mm. to die. Um, you know, imagine a 14 year old girl who a year earlier, because some of them were in the country for, uh, you know, less than a year, who a year earlier was playing outside every day in the sun in a very um, loud uh, factory building with particles of fiber in the air and really loud machinery and dangerous machinery that could catch your fingers or your your toes or whatever it is. Um, it must have been an incredibly shocking uh, experience for them. Um, but I do want to say, and then I'll pass the baton over to Ellen. Um, I do want to say that we know also that, um, you know, the girls had fun. These were young. Uh, the oldest was 40, the oldest of, of the workers to die in the fire. We don't know everyone who worked in the building because the records were destroyed in the fire that day. We do know there were about 500. We knew you know, many of them were women. Um, but um, we also know that from the oral testimony at the at Cornell at the Kiel Center uh, for Labor uh, Documentation and Archives, their online oral histories. We know they had fun. We know they sang. We know they you know they planned their lives. They 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 enjoyed the shirtwaists. You know, wearing the kinds of shirtwaists that they made, and they would tailor their own shirtwaists. And you know, they were young aspirational girls. Some of them wanted to live on a farm outside of the city. They had had enough. Um, so it was really hard and really dangerous at times, and and not the healthiest uh, way to live. Their, their income was absolutely necessary to their families in New York, but also to their families back in Italy. Um, but they had fun and they had plans and they had lives. So, you know, what we, what we shouldn't do is construct their lives as ones of utter and complete misery, right? I mean, mm -hmm. bread and roses, uh, they, they had as much um, life in them as any 14, 18, 22, 30 year old woman would have today. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that these were, in fact, um, a lot of them were teenagers, and we sort of think of teenagers and what's happening in teenagers' lives, you know, across the board, and and the jolts and the surprises. But um, you know, they also were fashioning new identities as they came to this country, just to the point of of Marianne. And one of the things that's fascinating in the visual record, um, in paintings of working class women, which a lot of elites sort of turned up their noses at is not high art, you see these very exuberant, joyous girls in their big hats and their up to the minute fashion dresses that as you point out, Marianne, they probably made themselves. But the other thing that happens in the, the use of our visual um, materials as a kind of documentary evidence is the way in which newspaper illustrations and editorial cartoons depicted these girls both before, during the, the massive shirtwaist strike of um, 1909 and then after the fire. And there are several very distinct typologies, one of which shows them as innocent, innocent victims. And to do that, many, many illustrators depicted them as not ethnic at all, that is sort of like sweet little faced Gibson girls. And then there's the, the, um, you know, the, the very downtrodden young women in the progressive era literature, and it only emphasizes the horror of their lives as a way to get across their victimhood. But many of these young women, apart from having fun, were really determined activists and wanting to better their lives. And I think that's another key thing. I mean, these were complicated identities fashioned from the experience of immigration, migration, massive responsibility within the family, but also young adolescent and 20 year olds. Thank you so much for those, those vivid pictures. Uh, can, you, can you explain for us the, the context of the Triangle Fire? So we, you touched a little bit, both of you, um, about the conditions inside of the buildings, um, how machines were packed and they were dangerous and there were fabric bits flying all over the place. Um, 
Can you can you tell us about why so many companies chose to employ immigrant women and um, particularly why were safety regulations so often completely disregarded or or overlooked or ignored? They were cheap. <laughs> I mean, that's the key, right? It's a cheap labor force then as now. Um, mm -hmm. They were cheap. They were willing and able to do the work. Um, they needed the money. Uh, they were not docile. I mean, some of them undoubtedly were, but in general, you know, there had been a huge strike in the in the industry, and and Ellen referred to you know what's called the uprising of the twenty thousand in nineteen oh nine. Primarily Jewish workers started with an incident at Triangle, and then led to you know this massive strike, the largest strike of women uh, up to its time. Um, we now are learning more. Uh, one of our contributors to the book, Michelle Fazio, talks about her family's radical organizing legacy in um, as socialists and anarchists and labor organizers, and they were active. Her um, uh, great uncles were active organizing in the 1909 strike among Italian women, trying to encourage Italian women to play an active role. So, um, you know, they were they were cheap. They were in some ways. I don't want to say desperate, though some of them definitely were, but they needed the money. Um, they were skilled uh, to a certain extent um, and to varying extents, actually. Um, so that was why they were recruited for the industry. Um, and I don't know, Ellen, if you want to say anything else about why. And, yeah, and that's why I some mean, of them, but I just want to add one more thing. That's why some, they were so young, because they were absolutely part of a family economy. And, right. and the final thing, too, is that not only family economies in the U.S., but, and, and you know, for the Jewish workers, this was a little bit different because they were fleeing pogroms and persecution. Mm -hmm. and, um, but for the Italians, they had family members back home who depended on their money uh, for survival. So when the fire happened, it disrupted not just the economy in the, the you know, of the workers immediately in, in New York and, and in New Jersey, but of families in Italy as well. That's how important their wages were. Yeah, and I was just going to say that apart from the greed, which is obvious, and they were cheap, um, they were so young that they were often hired for the less skilled jobs, particularly the young teenagers. They were clipping threads, um, you know, doing very sort of menial tasks for very, very little money. And you could move up a little bit, but you could never get to work for the men's wages. Part of that is also attitudes about women. Oh, these girls are just dropping by. We can't count on them to stay. They're going to leave. They're just working for pin money to buy all their fancy threads and big hats. When in fact, they were fashioning all those things themselves out of, you know, very, very inexpensive materials on the side on their own time. And these women were working to support their families. But it was a pervasive argument that was attitudes about women and attitudes about immigrant women in particular, that they weren't serious. I think you had two questions, Sarah, but I don't remember what the second <laughs> one was. Oh, yes. um, yeah. Safety regulations right. being overlooked. Yes. And I think Marianne touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, there, I found this wonderful quote earlier today where um, one of the progressive writers after the fire said, you know, the peddler on the street, the pushcart guy, the street sweeper, they all know that the reality is that these factories are in fact factories, but reality isn't official. And the official line on all those factories was that they were warehouses and warehouses were used for storage. And all of these factory owners turned them into these loft factory stasis spaces, but they weren't classified as such officially. So they got through everything with warehouse regulations. Oh. And also, you know, one of the things that happens after the Triangle Fire is nobody really knows where to point the finger because there was no like buck stops here, right? Uh, the, the 
the fire safety division that is now under the, the fire department FDNY of New York City didn't exist until after the Triangle Fire. The American Society for Safety Engineers, which trains safety professionals and does inspections, didn't exist. The occupational you know, safety, OSHA, right? Occupational mm -hmm. safety and health, is, that didn't exist until the New Deal. And the New Deal in part exists because of the Triangle Fire. That was Frances mm -hmm. Perkins, right? She, the mm -hmm. New Deal began on March 25th, 1911. There was no such thing as workers' comp. Um, so if workers got hurt, the, the owners and the, the, you know, nobody felt responsible. They would just replace them with somebody else. So there was this kind of mishmash of regulations. Most of them were really toothless because there was minimal enforcement. The, the entities that we look to today to enforce safety, which are way understaffed, OSHA is way understaffed, um, they didn't exist at all. Um, you know, things like fire drills were not required, and so they just, they didn't happen. So when the fire happened, nobody really knew what to do. Um, fire escapes, one of, you know, the fire escape on the building that led into a courtyard of to nowhere, um, in you know sort of inside like this square inside the building it led to this courtyard to nowhere that was considered a third exit and when workers tried to use it to escape the fire it collapsed because it never got tested um, to yeah see how and it because, it, because it was made of wood and um a, an, inv an investigator or reporter after the fire calculated that for that fire escape to safely get everyone down from the building it would have taken three hours and the fire was over in 25 minutes. So it was useless. And then it broke and sent a bunch of women plummeting to the ground. I just want to add too, because I know, you know, I, I think of Northeastern PA anyway, but certainly, you know, Pennsylvania generally and mm -hmm. on both sides as coal country, right? Um, that's mm -hmm. when my, my, the men in my family were all coal miners and the women were garment workers. And that was often the case. Um, but, you know, coal mining is a really dangerous business. So is timber working, meat packing, and all of these industries were extraordinarily dangerous in 1911. Like, so it was it was just it was a fact of life. It was a horrible fact of life and it and it should not have been that way. But, you know, uh, people, lumber workers would get killed by saws, uh, meat workers and meat plants would would you know, be freezing, they would electric, they would get electrocuted. Um, textile silk workers, right? They'd get their hair stuck in the machines and they'd get scalped. Um, this happened all the time and it was just, oh, well, you know, if, if something happens to you, we'll just get another person. Right. Uh, if they even thought of them as persons to replace They didn't, them. they didn't, yeah. yeah. So this was throughout industry in the mm -hmm. US in the early 20th century. There was just no consideration of worker safety. So we're obviously we're talking about some pretty heavy things, right? Some yeah. some horrifying things. Um, in your both of your in your research and in your writing, um, in talking to the girls, what has been an aspect of either the research or the writing or the interviews um, that has impacted you or that has stayed with you the most? Um, has there been um, one moment or one story in particular that just like that, that just stunned you or took your breath away or something that you, you still think about. Ellen, do you wanna go first for this one? Well, um, I mean, it's, it's really interesting or shall I say difficult mm -hmm. to boil it down to one thing. And I'm sure, I mean, I've been, I've been so moved in reading the book, just listening to the stories of family members or, or generations before. Um, I should say, just a, a quick little personal note, um, Annie Valliere got in touch with me the other day because her, um, her uh, is it her father was Herb Schneiderman and I knew her her parents, because they lived in this building, my uh, condo building. And so we've been having this really, really lovely exchange. But I mean, her stories about Rose Schneiderman and her relationship to the Triangle Fire have always affected me. But, you know, what drew me in and what have affected me, have affected me deeply are just certain key images. And, you know, John Sloan's cartoon of in the aftermath of the Triangle Fire in the Socialist Call, where he shows a deeply burned body and spares nothing. 
is, is so powerful because he was a painter and an artist conforming to all of those traditions of genteel painting and beautiful women. And to do this was just, he was so angry. I mean, we can read his diaries about it. Um, and and there are, are, are many other things. I have to say personally, part of what has moved me deeply has just been the participatory nature of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition and participating in chalk, participating in carrying shirtwaist kites at the commemoration and just talking to everyone. It's really been life-changing. So I'm going to show you an image of the, the book. The, the title is Talking to the Girls, Intimate and Political Essays on the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. And when Ellen is talking about shirtwaists, and Sarah, you described what a, a shirt, it basically is a crisp cotton blouse, right? It was influenced by a woman's uh, fashion icon that was influenced by men's shirts. And so what we did with the coalition is we made these and we put them on poles and we made a sash with the name of each worker who died in the mm -hmm. fire. And you can see they're on the cover, but you see these girls, these are middle school students from Long Island. One of our contributors, Kimberly Schiller, writes an essay about teaching the Triangle Fire to middle school students. And that's, um, that's the, it's the girls part that stuck the yeah. most with me. It, mm -hmm. is, um, it is thinking of my mother who was 17 when she started working in a garment factory in Pennsylvania and who knew about this story and knew that these girls died and so she would be okay because it called attention to safety. It's the girls that Kim Schiller brought uh, and brings every year to the annual commemoration at the building who we put on the cover, who are so moved by this story because it's girls like them who died in this fire. Um, and it's, it's the introduction where um, at the very end of the introduction, we say, you know, these girls should never have been walk working in a factory anyway. And then we list all the teenagers. And yeah. every time I get to that paragraph and it's just name after name after name mm -hmm. of teenagers, in the fire, it makes me cry. And then finally, the last um, essay in the book is called Listening to Calpona. And it's an interview that my co-editor and I did with Calpona Actor, who is an internationally renowned organizer of garment workers in Bangladesh. And she's the one after the Tazreen, um, after the Tazreen fire in 2012, I believe it was, and the Rana Plaza factory collapse that killed over 1,100 people in 2013, she's the one who crept among the rubble and held out the labels for the children's place and all these other, you know, child-friendly retailers of clothes who are knowingly having their clothes manufactured in unsafe conditions where there are other child workers. And Calpona herself started working in a factory when she was just a child, and she talks about what it's like to be playing outside one day and then in a factory with scissors in your hand the next day and the other children who work there. And she said, we have no stories of our childhood. That's the biggest thing that mm -hmm. child labor robs you of is a childhood, which means no stories to tell. And so for me, the thing that has stuck with me is the fact that, you know, the title is not just a catchy title. Um, yeah, there are still girls burning in factories around the world, uh, working in factories when they shouldn't and and dying in factories when they shouldn't. And as Calpona says, you know, um, nothing has changed about Triangle except the place. It is 1911 in China, in Bangladesh, even in Italy, there was a factory fire not too long ago. Um, so that's what really struck me is that we are still allowing girls to work and and work in conditions where they die. Um, and I just want to just apropos of what Ellen said, Annie Valier is the great niece of Rose Schneiderman, who was herself a really young labor activist who organized and gave this incredible speech after the Triangle Fire and galvanized uh, New Yorkers to try to put a stop to this child labor and these horrific working conditions. Um, so she's also one of our contributors, as is Francis Perkins' grandson, Tomlin Kagashal, and Martin Abramowitz, whose father he thinks started the fire. Um, so it, you know, this, these stories, um, you know, they really resonate down through the generations. And that's one of the things we try to capture in the book is how they remain relevant um, mm -hmm. throughout the years, alas. Alas. I, I would say that's certainly one of the hardest parts of our jobs as, as historians and as educators, we're making connections between past and present every day. You know, we, we study the past to learn from it, to carry those lessons forward. And it's it's difficult, I think, when you 
not not necessarily when you find something that you feel very passionate about and that you're researching because it carries you, um, but then how you how you watch those connections in real time, right? As as you said, it's triangle is still happening. It's just not 1911 in New York City anymore, right? Um, so. Yeah. I know there I mean, it's, are. It's, um, sorry, it's also happening at you know when workers are locked in Walmart, right? Or right, Amazon right. when they you know when workers have to pee in a bottle in Amazon, or when poultry you know meat packing workers during COVID don't have um, sick time and have to work yeah. and, sick and die. Um, so yeah, we don't make clothes here very much anymore on a large scale. So that kind of stuff happens. The, the garment manufacturing accidents tend to happen elsewhere, but we still have our own triangle workers. Um, so to speak, right. in other industries right. in the U.S. Absolutely. I know, I, re I remember I was watching um, a program not that long ago from the Tenement Museum that was talking about um, garment factories in Chinatown in the, in the 1980s. It's mm -hmm. not that long ago. Um, so can you, can you um, do you have, I would say, advice for um, young historians or historians who are trying to break into the field, do you have advice for them on how you approach difficult topics, these heavy topics, um, and how you, how you treat those topics respectfully? Ellen, do you wanna? Um, you know, I was, I was thinking, thinking a little bit about this. First of all, stay with it don't be afraid of the conflict. It's really difficult. It's really emotional. Um, and it's, it's very, very hard, but don't shy away from the complexity. And, you know, something that Marianne was just doing in her comments to, to be very aware and really, really historicize those moments in the past. Um, and then also to historicize the perspectives from which we're bringing, bringing our questions about the past. You know, I just, uh, history, history, history. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and, but, but also don't be fearful of the tough topics and don't be afraid of your feelings. That was probably the hardest part about the essay. <laughs> Yeah, well, these are intimate and political essays. So what we ask people to do is find their entry point hmm. into the triangle, like like you know, and and trying to do as I do as I do, not just as I say. Uh -huh. You know, began talking about my personal history because my work on the Triangle Fire doesn't make sense to me anyway without recalling my relationship to women in the garment industry, which is very personal and familial. Um, right. so I think, you know, I agree with Ellen, don't, don't shy away from really understanding what draws you uh, to a topic or what, what brings a topic to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we sometimes, uh, uh, scholars often talk about like their topics find them. There's something almost karmic about it. It speaks to you. And certainly this did um, the mm -hmm. triangle fire for me. I think the other thing, and I tell this to my students, I'm teaching, I'm teaching a course on radical women this semester, and it's really, really yeah. terrific. And, um, you know, one of the things we talk about is uh, how this, you know, it's easy to fall into the trap of, oh, man, like, you know, workers in, in Lowell in the 1840s were calling for equal pay for equal work, and we still haven't gotten that. Oh, everything stinks, nothing's improved. Well, in fact, you know, there are some things that still stink in the very same way they did in, you know, the mid 19th century and in 1911 at the Triangle Factory, right? Um, but things have changed. And I think that's always the balance between recognizing that, you know, again, getting back to historicizing, recognizing what is history and how things have changed, uh, not falling into the, oh, everything's so much better, um, but also not right. falling. A lot of young people today seem to me to be really kind of bummed out that nothing seems possible to change and that all they get from history is like stories of how things are awful and haven't changed and they were awful and in some ways they still are awful but you know I talked about the new deal one of the things we learned from triangle the most hopeful part of the story of triangle is what happened afterwards this was awful 146 people died and they shouldn't have right but then we got like laws against child labor and you know think look around your 
building and anyone who's on this event, look around the next time you're in a public building, doors open outward, triangle fire. Maximum mm -hmm. occupancy limits, triangle fire. If you've ever had to do a fire drill and you thought, oh man, I got stuff to do and I got to do this triangle, this fire drill, triangle fire. Fire escapes, triangle fire. Social security checks, triangle fire, right? I mean, Frances Perkins, the first female secretary of labor saw the fire and it changed her forever. And she said like, I'm gonna fight for working people for the rest of my life. And, and she did. Right. And working people fought for themselves. Right. Lots of really militant strike activity after the Triangle Fire. Suffragists said, holy cow, we got to get the vote, because if we don't get to vote for good people who make good laws, we end up dead like the girls at Triangle. So change is possible um, if people work together and push for it. And I think that's the value of studying history, not just learning about what happened, but what did people do about it? Mm -hmm. um, and there's where the hope lies. Yeah, absolutely. Don't give up hope. <laughs> right, um, I do have one more question and I want to remind participants that are tuning in that you can use the chat feature if you have any questions that you would like to ask the participants. Um, so could you tell us um, about the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition? Um, I know we, we've been talking, um, especially this last question, of don't give up, there is hope, right? Um, what, what projects are you working on and what are your plans for the future, either in your um, your academic careers or with the Triangle Fire Coalition or your book comes out today. Oh my goodness. Um, so what's next? Um, so the, the book, um, and I'm just going to encourage, it's, yeah. it's a not, it, there are many, um, uh, people relied on, on lots of archival sources and scholarly sources to write their personal essays, but the book is really readable. It is not intended really readable. to be an academic book. So if, you know, if people are moved by these stories, if they're, they have, feel their own personal connection to history, um, you should pick it up and check it out. Um, you can order it from New Village Press. We have a, if you triangle 25, there's a 25% discount. Um, and, and I think it, it's really inspirational. So this, um, it is not a project, however, of Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition, although there is a lot about the coalition in it. Um, the coalition was founded in 2008. Um, it's a, you know, pub, it's an arts activist public history organization that is committed to connecting people and organizations in New York, New York City, New York State, the US, the world, uh, to the story of Triangle um, and the social movements that e either were galvanized by it or emerged after the fire um, to change uh, the way we do uh, workplace safety and child labor and all these other things in the US and to really strengthen unions. Um, and the first thing that the coalition did was to really uh, was to link people together, and this is how Ellen and I met, uh, for events for the centennial of the fire, which was in 2011. And the second thing we committed ourselves to is to build a permanent memorial um, at the, at the uh, Brown Building. So the building where the fire happened, as I mentioned earlier, is a, it's a really nice neo-Renaissance building. It's an NYU building. It has some plaques on it, but you know, you could walk right past it and not see it because the plaques blend in. I've literally been standing in front of the building and had someone come up to me, a family, a couple, a, an individual ask me where the Triangle Building is. Oh. So what, yeah, so what we wanna do is make it impossible for anyone to walk past the corner of Washington and Green, see the Brown Building and say, where's the Triangle Building? And that's, uh, that is the project um, that we've been working on. I've been working on leading this project for over a dozen years. We're finally going to dedicate this memorial on March 25th, 2023. It will tell the story of the fire. Um, it will name all of the people who died. It will give their ages. It will uh, provide uh, samples of eyewitness testimony. It's very spare, the design, but it's very moving. If you go to our website, www.rememberthetrianglefire.org, you can see some of the images. And uh, it will be translated into Italian and Yiddish. So to my knowledge, it is the first trilingual memorial in the United States, maybe in the world, I don't really know, probably the only Italian, English and Yiddish memorial in the world. And it will be the first, wait for it, the first labor memorial in New York City. There is, New York is one of the most dense union uh, um, places in the US and we have no labor memorial. Uh, so it will be New York's first labor memorial, and it will be one of a, a very small number of memorials that uh, speak to 
um, women's stories in in New York or in the in the in the U.S. for that matter. Um, so that's the project that that I've been working on, um, and that will come to fruition almost a year to the day from today. So I'm really excited about that. And you said on the 25th. That's the anniversary of the fire, right? That's yeah. our yes. That's yeah. our target is that we're dedicating this memorial 112 years later. Um, on the day where we commemorate the fire. So come, everyone who's here, please come. Our hope is yeah. that it will be a destination um, memorial in New York. People will come like they come to see, uh, you know, the Empire State Building mm -hmm. or the Hunger Memorial. You know, there's a memorial for uh, the Irish famine or even um, Alaska World Trade Center Museum and Memorial. Um, but yeah, we're, we uh, we feel, feel really strongly that uh, this really has to happen. This is a story that needs to be told 365 days a year. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's simultaneously inspiring, but also horrifying that there is no other labor memorial in New um, York City. It's yeah, I actually didn't know that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not good at telling the stories of working people. Um, yeah. But. Um, you know, my parents, I told you my family's from um, the Wilkes-Barre area. You know, I walk around or drive around like in Pittston, there's a minor um, mm -hmm. memorial. There's a mural um, right near my, one of my favorite, the tomato bar in Pittston that has Ooh. like workers in the, you know, agriculture, I mean, um, industrial workers of all different kinds. We don't, we don't have that in New York and we really need to, we need to do that. Um, yeah. And this is, I think, the perfect place to begin. Yeah. Yeah. So if we don't have any questions in the chat, I did, um, I included the discount code, I included the, um, the link to purchase the book from NYU Press and the link to the remember the trianglefirecoalition.org. Um, so is there anything that we would like to close on? Any, any last thoughts or comments? We, we've gone through we do have a quite the discussion tonight. <laughs> There's a um, question from Roseanne, okay. but I can't. Oh, uh, Roseanne wants to know, wondering what you think of the status of unions today. It's a heavy well, question, you know, Roseanne. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Roseanne. There's a lot of activity. You know, there are these incredible organizing campaigns happening at uh, Amazon and Starbucks. Starbucks. And there's been a strike at the Warrior Met Mine for almost a year in Alabama, coal miners. Um, oh, wow. There's, yeah, there's been, you know, strikes in all kinds of different industries and even student workers um, at Columbia University were striking not too long ago. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of energy in the movement. Something is happening. I think everybody who's in labor circles is aware that something is happening. Uh, lots of uh, people more than ever in the recent past see unions favorably, particularly young people, and lots of people want to belong to unions. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the last survey was, you know, an extraordinarily high number of workers would like to have a union in their workplace. The problem is that it's really hard to organize. Mm -hmm. um, ever since the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1946, right. um, it's, it's, you know, lots of activities that unions would use to um, to draw attention to unfair labor practices have been declared uh, illegal and lots of things that employers can do um, to stop union organizing campaigns uh, have been legalized where they were you know, rendered illegal by the um, National Labor Relations Act of, I believe, 1935. So we've had a law in the books for quite some time that makes it difficult for workers to organize. And we've had, um, you know, the, the organizing campaign at Amazon, for example, in Bessemer last year, uh, Alabama, uh, lots of um, pressure tactics on the workers not to organize. Starbucks right now, the workers there are um, facing extraordinary pressure. Uh, organizers are getting fired. They're having their hours cut. Um, so uh, one of the things we could do, I think, to, um, to really help working people in the US is to make it easier for them to organize themselves. Um, and I think if we lifted some of those restrictions, the Protect the Right to Organize Act, the PRO Act, for example, which is stalled in, in, um, in Congress, if we could lift some of the restrictions by passing an act like the PRO Act, which undoes some of the kind of negative stuff of Taft-Hartley, um, I think we would see a, a serious uptick 
and the number of people who are organizing and a serious uptick in, in um, union militancy. And I will just leave before I, I bounce it off to Ellen, if she has any thoughts. You might not think that the Starbucks coffee union organizing campaign has anything to do with the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, but in fact, the union, <laughs> Starbucks Workers United is the same union that the Triangle workers tried to join in 1909. It was called the ILGWU, the International Ladies <laughs> Garment yeah. Workers Union, but through the years, it morphed into Workers United. Mm -hmm. So the same union with a different name is now on the forefront of organizing baristas, where in the past it was on the forefront of organizing uh, women and men in the garment industry. So, you know, the struggle continues. Um, and so the story remains relevant. Had the Triangle workers had a union like the ILGWU, they would not have had the doors locked most likely. And they, more of them would have been able to escape when the fire broke out. Um, so, you know, good luck to the Starbucks workers and good luck to Workers United. Um, right. And it's filtering down. Marianne and I were talking earlier um, my local bookstore, which is actually pretty well known, it's called Politics in Prose in Washington, DC. Oh. Um, it's going ahead with the union organization. And that'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. Hey. yeah. So, you know, uh, in answer to the question, there's hope. Um, the numbers are still down uh, there from, you know, where they recently, uh, yes, hope. Um, but uh, I think, and also I think um, labor education is key. People need to know how important um, unions have been mm -hmm. and that we still need them because we do. Yeah, absolutely. Every, everything, everything is connected, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Thank you to everyone who joined us today for this amazing and incredibly thought-provoking program. Um, I encourage you all to, um, if not purchase the book, um, you can also request it from a local library. Yeah, there you go. It's a gorgeous cover. It's um, a gorgeous cover. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much for having us. And thank you to thank everyone. Thank you so much. This was this was really fun to do, and we're so glad that you were all able to come. Yes, um, so this is being recorded. Um, it should be up on our YouTube within a few days. Um, give it a few days then after it's uploaded for it to um, generate the auto captions, um, and then I'll just go through and make sure everything is spelled correctly, everyone's name is spelled correctly. Um, and then I will email everyone who signed up so that you can also have the YouTube link. We'll put it up on our social medias. Um, and that is all for me. I hope you all have a lovely night. I hope you enjoy the spring sunshine outside. And we will see you on the YouTube recording, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You so right. much Sarah. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Thanks, Sarah. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>